Okay, very good morning. Welcome to the rundown for Tuesday the 13th of April. Uh, just going to get you up to speed on the close on Wall Street, which was relatively flat. What's happened overnight in Asia, some trade data to speak of. Just had the UK GDP numbers out. We've got German ZEW coming at 10 o'clock with US CPI at 1.30 this afternoon. Also, some really interesting comments coming out of Fed's Bullard about a potential timeline for when we could see discussions over tapering in the US Federal Reserve. Uh, and then an update on US-China relations, the COVID program in the UK. Uh, so quite a few things there to get you up to speed on. But starting with the close on Wall Street, and I've got a chart here of the VIX, which has been trading at a 13-month low. Uh, I think most intraday uh, speculative traders getting a little bit frustrated by the lack of movement we've been seeing, particularly in US equities of late. But I would say that's largely understandable. Um, we have gone through a period of kind of the dust settling on fears about the uh, kind of inflation expectations rising, uh, higher yield movement, which we saw causing a degree of market disruption just a few weeks ago. The dust has settled on that topic, I would say, and people have acclimatized to the fact that there will be rising inflation, which we're looking for to materialize in the data later on today. Um, but <coughs> I guess one thing with the VIX, we are trading below 20 at the moment. It is a 13 month low. As you can see on the chart here, episodes of a, of a kind of depressed VIX tend to be followed by breakouts of uh, flashes of volatility. Um, what that catalyst could be, really yet to be seen. But obviously, I think markets have been quiet for a couple of different reasons. We've had the Easter holiday just, just recently. We've also got from a calendar perspective, yesterday was particularly quiet, but we go into from now really, US CPI this afternoon, you've got retail sales, industrial, industrial production uh, coming out later on in the week. You've got US earnings also commencing with the big banks starting to report pre-market on Wednesday. So there's a few things coming up uh, and so I can understand people's kind of just sitting on their hands waiting for some further information to materialize. Uh, and particularly with, we've had a push up um, quite nicely up to record high territory once again in a number of the US indices. So a period of consolidation is not unusual, I would say, uh, for the time being. Uh, but a quick look at the charts this morning. Um, how are things uh, as they stand? Well, equity index futures pretty pretty flat open overall. Uh, not really too much to speak of. Um, the DAX is tra trading absolutely flat in the futures market. Uh, just keeping an eye from that Friday low, which was the range weekly low generally that we had for the second half of last week, coming up to the low that we printed at the open yesterday morning and the retest that we had uh, late in the US session. Uh, that trend line just holding for the time being, but one to watch. Any breakdown of that, be targeting down at that kind of double bottom that we saw yesterday evening uh, for the DAX at 15 to 26. Upside break of range to keep an eye on today, 15 to 74 for any further push on the upside. Retest of yesterday's high, you've got the R1 as well sitting uh, just above. Otherwise, currency markets pretty quiet. Uh, the Dixie did firm up a little bit overnight, uh, but it's up only about one tenth. So marginal change, if anything, in the major pairs. Cable's pretty much flat. Um, and, and euro dollar down just 10 pips. Bit of dollar appreciation overnight though has weighed on gold uh, just very mildly. Uh, we saw a breakdown technically of the, the move through uh, yesterday's lowest point that was seen at 1727. And as you can see here, just saw a bit of a run on prices through that technical breach to come down to test at the S1 before seeing a bit of a bounce. So to me, um, definitely much more technical on that move as what would be characteristic of that extension on the wick on the gold price there. Um, direction need for gold, uh, continuation to be, um, whether or not that move can be continued, I'd be looking at cues from the, the currency market, i.e. the, the direction on play and the, the dollar um, to get a bit more understanding of that, whether that um, will continue. Gold down six bucks at the moment, oil pretty much unchanged. Uh, and then in the 10 year, we are down about four and a half ticks and we're really testing the low we had on Friday. Um, the US 10 year yield is sitting around 1.7% at the moment. You did have the double header yesterday, um, kicking off this kind of slew of uh, bond issuance coming out of the US um, in the, the days and weeks ahead. Um, we did have a three and 10 year note auction, slightly lower demand yesterday, but going out without going through without any major hitches is the main kind of summary. You've got the 30 year bond auction happening at 6 p.m. later on 
uh, tonight as well. As far as the overnight session is concerned, <coughs> excuse me, I will shake off this cough at some point, in, uh, hopefully in the near future. Um, but we did have some Chinese data overnight. I wouldn't say this is a, a great deal of um, kind of reaction to this. Um, the trade balance headline figure 89.98 billion, Chinese yuan versus expected 327 billion. Uh, so the surplus slightly smaller than expected. Exports um, a miss on expectations year on year 20 spot 7 against expectations of 28.6. Imports though higher 27.7 against 17.6. And as you can see here, import growth the highest in four years. A couple of things that um, analysts were commenting on overnight when I've read about this Chinese trade data is they were kind of questioning the ability to for China to continue to kind of remain so robust on the export side going forward in the weeks, months ahead as the vaccination rollout continues and other countries start to get back on their feet and manufacturing activity there starts to pick up and kind of taking away then from um, the kind of China boom that we've seen after they were quite early in the reopening uh, post the initial phase of COVID. But all in all, I wouldn't read too much into the Chinese trade data. I don't think it's necessarily a, a particularly big deal this morning. Um, on the China front, something to be aware of is Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen will decline to name China a currency manipulator in her first semi-annual foreign exchange report, according to people familiar with the matter uh, on Bloomberg. Uh, it hasn't been finalised yet. The report's due to come out on Thursday. Um, the reason why I'm just pointing this out, bringing it to your attention, is because obviously there's an ongoing degree of friction at the moment as the Biden administration starts to find its feet at the initial negotiations with China, um, having had that meeting in Alaska uh, just a few weeks ago. And so this could have been a potential um, platform to escalate that confrontation but it doesn't look like that's going to happen uh, at this point so i'd say uh, this is kind of a, a potential r increase in risk over tensions on that relationship just uh, being averted at this point with what's what's said to have happened here um, the other thing i wanted to talk about in a little bit more detail was this it's really interesting comments out of a federal reserve member uh, called james bullard now bullard is uh, very leaning on the dovish side of the, the kind of monetary spectrum. Um, importantly, Bullard as well as a non-voting member. Uh, and a little bit of context as well about the individual himself. Bullard does tend to be uh, fairly vocal about his thoughts on the economy and, and future monetary policy. And he has been known as well to flip-flop uh, a little bit between his, his views. So he kind of moves around the dovehawk kind of spectrum a little bit. So now that I've given it relevant caveats, what exactly did he say? Did he say? Well, he said that getting 75% of Americans vaccinated would be a signal that the COVID-19 crisis was ending. And so therefore a necessary condition for the central bank to then start considering the conversations around bomb buying tapering. Um, so that is probably the first um, kind of numerical time to, or milestone that we've heard from a Federal Reserve official tied to vaccination. So the question is then, well, where are we with vaccinations at the moment? And can we extrapolate out then at what sort of timing could we expect this taper talk to start emerging, given that he's tabled a 75% figure uh, for the initiation of that? And first things first, this is a look at the share of people who have received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. And if we start to focus in here, you can see the UK out in front um, coming up to around the 50% mark, but the United States also a real front runner on the developed world side of things. And I was looking at these numbers last night, 36% of Americans have been given a first vaccine dose, 22% at the moment are fully vaccinated, according to the Bloomberg vaccine tracker and this data here. Uh, would kind of match up with that. Now, one of the things I was looking at then was, I was looking at generally what's the supply situation in America and when could we then start to expect a rough timeline of what it might look like when the US might be at a point where they hit 75%. Here, what we're looking at is a time frame um, going from January, March, May to July. And we're looking at the three major manufacturers that are supplying vaccines in the US. 
Um, as you can see, the one which has, is the smallest by far at this present point is Johnson & Johnson. But as we go forward over time, going through into May, into June, the J&J &J manufacturing starts to pick up pace and further um, larger quantities of supply start to, be, to start to hit the market. Major milestones here, given the strategy of America has been mainly led by Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines, um, at the end of May, both those two companies have promised around 200 million extra shots to come. J&J's kind of milestone marker is, by the end of June, a delivery of 100 million. So you can see here that the available uh, kind of vaccine starts to really ramp up going forward, which should further accelerate what has been, on average, around 3.214 million shots uh, being delivered in America. And it's been moving up to pretty much consistent record territory at the moment and moving faster. Um, applying the math then, it would take approximately around three months to cover around 75% of the population. So to see this number at 36 to get up to 75, we're talking middle of May, middle of June, middle of July to get there. So this gives us a rough reference point then if Bullard were to be believed of when we could then start to be hearing about um, the the overall kind of what's the state of the US economy at that point in time. There'll be obviously lots of other variables to consider that will be in play. And will the Fed then need to start altering their language? Now, I guess that puts even more pressure on the June meeting, which is the next with the summary of economic projections from the Fed. That'll be particularly interesting because by that point, we could probably extrapolate out the trajectory of how the vaccination path is looking from the US as to whether or not we're on track at that point. Plus as well, what is the current underlying macroeconomic situation from the data that we're seeing? Uh, so as we were saying, in the, at the actual March meeting of the Fed, the June one is becoming ever increasingly more important. Um, you know, even though with the VIX, I'm sure we'll see a breakout on the upside before then, but certainly by June, that even though things economically might be really strong at that point in the US, actually from a policy perspective, it creates quite a headache for the Fed to manage then a shift in communication. And could that be the disruptive next big market event that unfolds uh, in the middle of the summer? It will be interesting to see. Uh, on the COVID side, <coughs> as you saw, the UK is really a front runner uh, in terms of the number of people who have been vaccinated with the first jab. Um, coming up here at around the 47.3% marker at the moment. Um, the news generally has been that the, the UK has passed a significant milestone, according to the Prime Minister yesterday, that they basically, they, they've conducted now uh, and vaccinated everyone in the nine highest risk groups, which means they can now push ahead towards their goal of vaccinating all other adults uh, by the end of July. And so starting to target some of the the demographic that's generally of a lower age, uh, sub, sub 50. On the calendar for today, what have we got? So just to wrap things up, um, we've already had the UK GDP come out, uh, but as you probably saw in my morning notes, um, and, and subsequently in the movement in the pound, very limited reaction. The GDP estimate month to month, 0.4% gets expected 06 So a positive move back higher from what was a negative print we saw at the beginning of the month, but um, not surprising at all, just given the fact that the previous numbers were, were very depressed, given the fact that we just went to a state of new national lockdown and also the new post-Brexit relationship between the UK and the EU. So a bit of a pickup, 0.4 against 0.6 is really um, not that meaningful at all as far as sterling is concerned. Um, otherwise, going further forward, we do get the latest German ZEW uh, coming out. Uh, that is expected on the headline to show an improvement to 79 from 76.6. Um, I don't necessarily think that that's gonna be particularly market impactful for the reasons being that perhaps analysts were a little bit more optimistic. The COVID situation still somewhat to be monitored very vigilantly in, in Germany given the recent uptick in cases. But given the rollover restrictions that we've had, it's almost like now we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. So there's room for very mild optimism going forward, but nothing I think that the markets are going to get excited about from a reactionary point of view. 
Uh, and then the main focus probably from a Canada perspective today is the US CPI report. Uh, as you can see here, the, the year on year expected at 2.5% against 1.7. The core expected 1.3, so a little bit more moderate uh, improvement from 1.3% last time out. Just to remind you, the analysts at Nomura made a good comment yesterday. Uh, they said that not to get too frothy over this release, uh, a year ago base effects will start leading US core CPI higher. So if you think about it, where we were back in 2020 in April, we just had an almighty hit to the global economy as the, the whole globe went into lockdown. And so demand dropped off a cliff so if you're looking at the year ago base effects and energy was crashing in April, it's the absolute opposite of where we are at the moment, where energy and fuel prices generally have been elevated. Um, so that's what this disparity will be between now starting to see quite rapid um, rises in inflation numbers, but perfectly explainable for these reasons, which should help markets rationalize and contain subsequent market kind of reaction to the numbers when they come out and if they are on the high side. Um, the other thing is then not only is uh, these upticks in inflation like to be expected, but likely to be managed again appropriately by Jerome Powell when he speaks. He's speaking tomorrow. Um, he's probably going to just toe the line as he has done going forward. Um, otherwise, calendar got the API crude oil inventories um, after market as usual. A couple of speakers, probably Daily, Barkin, and Bostic uh, are the main ones because they're all voting members. Uh, they're going to be speaking all at 5 p.m. London time. And as I mentioned earlier, you've got 24 billion, the 30 year bond auction coming out in the States with some Italian supply this morning for those interested in the fixed income market. All right, that is it from me. Uh, any questions at all, feel free to drop me a comment. If you're watching this delayed on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. And for the guys at Fire Live, I'll see you in the Discord room. Have a good day ahead.